This is African American History's American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories which will paint a vivid picture of the effects of segregation, discrimination, and bigotry on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. Slavery was abolished just 150 years ago. Jim Crow, only 50 years ago. Yet stop and frisk, voter ID, stand your ground, income inequality, and a host of other current problems are proof that their detrimental effects continue to be felt and that the struggle for equal rights for all must continue. I am Mary Fields. People call me Black Mary. People call me Stagecoach Mary. I am six feet tall. I weigh over 200 pounds. I'm a woman of the 19th century. I do bold and exciting things. I wear pants. I smoke a big black cigar. I drink whiskey. I carry a pistol. I love adventure. I travel the country driving a stagecoach, delivering the mail to distant towns. Strong, I fight through rainstorms. Tough, I fight through snowstorms. I risk hurricanes and tornadoes. I am independent. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody tells me where to go. When I'm not delivering the mail, I like to build buildings. I like to smoke and drink in bars with the men. I like to be rough. I like to be rowdy. I also like to be loving. I like to be caring. I like to babysit. I like to plant flowers and tend my garden. I like to give away corsages and bouquets. I like being me, Mary Fields. Born a slave in Hickman County, Tennessee, somewhere around 1832, Mary Fields would go on to be the first African-American woman employed as a mail carrier in the United States, and only the second American woman to work for the United States Postal Service. She could outdrink, outshoot, and outfight just about any man in the old and wild west. She was definitely badass, long before anyone even thought to use that term. This is the story of Stagecoach Mary. My mother, Susanna, and I was owned by Judge Edmund Dunn, and we worked in his home there on his plantation in Hickman County, Tennessee. The judge said that my ma was his favorite cook. She also worked as personal servant to Mrs. Josephine Dunn. Now, Mrs. Dunn, allow me to play with the judge's younger sister, Dolly, because we were about the same age. Now, she will grow up to be called Mother Mary Amadeus, on account of her becoming a nun and all. I learned to read and write from Dolly. My ma wanted me to have a last name, and since her husband, my father Buck, worked in the fields, she gave me the name Mary Fields. In 1865, after slavery ended and we was freed, I left for Mississippi to work as a chambermaid on the steamboat Robert E. Lee. But after a while, I came back to work for Judge Dunn. I worked nursing his sick wife, who had taken ill. Mrs. Dunn died of pneumonia on January 1st, 1883. You wanted to see me, Judge? Yes, Mary, come in. Mary, you have been just wonderful with the children since my dear Josephine's passing. I wanted to thank you. Shucks, Judge. You ain't got to thank me. Happy to do it. Miss Josephine... She was one in a million. Yes, yes she was. And I'm afraid a far better parent to our children than I could ever hope to be. Oh, now don't say that, Judge. You just busy is all. You just... No need to spare my feelings, Mary. We both know I'm just not equipped to raise five young children all by myself. I'm away so often that now when, when they look at me, they see nothing more than just a passing acquaintance. But that's going to change. 
Once you spend some more time with them, they'll just get used to That's see. just it, Mary. I don't have time. Not the time it would take to raise them right. I'm nearly 50 years old, without so much as the smallest clue as to raising them. No. No, I would be doing them a disservice. Josephine and I always wanted only what was best for our children. And that is why I believe it is best if they go to live with my sister in Ohio. You sure about that, Judge? I've already written her about it. And I know she will raise them properly. So I soon find myself escorting Judge Dunn's five motherless children to their aunt, Mother Mary Amadeus, formerly known as Dolly. You remember, the one that taught me to read and write? Well, she wasn't just a nun. No, sir. She was the mother superior of an Ursuline convent in Toledo, Ohio. Ursuline. That's a specific order of nuns devoted to teaching. Once we were there, Dolly, uh, I mean Mother Mary Amadeus, couldn't have been nicer to them kids. She asked me to stay on a while to help them adjust, seeing as how I was the only thing in their poor little lives that was familiar with. In 1884, Mother Mary Amadeus was sent to St. Peter's Mission in the Montana Territory to establish a school for Indian girls. The Montana Territory was some rough country back then. It would be another five more years before it would become a state, so it was still some rough and harsh country. I was still at the Ursuline Convent back in Ohio, taking care of the children, when we got word that Mother Mary Amadeus was ill. I thought to myself, Lord, these poor kids' family members is all dropping one after the other. So I set out to nurse her back to health. Now, I don't like to brag. <laughs> oh, hell, yes, I do. I'm just about the best when it comes to nursing and all. If you ain't too far gone, I can get you back on your feet. Ask anybody. Well, anyway, I got the Mother Superior back on her feet. Everybody at St. Peter's Mission had done wrote that woman off for dead. But not me. How you feeling? God bless you, dear Mary. The way everyone was whispering and crying, I thought it was my time to meet the Lord for sure. Now you know that weren't gonna happen, Mother Mary. Not with me taking care of you. <laughs> <laughs> you are a good and true friend, Mary Fields. Look, my time at St. Peter's is through here, so I'll be going back to Toledo with you. Well, I... And I can guarantee you the position of caretaker at the convent. A permanent position. Well, that's mighty tempting. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to turn you down. You see, I decided to stay here in Cascade. Stay? In Montana? Mary, I'm only here because this is where I was assigned. But why would you wish to stay in this untamed wilderness if you didn't have to? I don't know. There's just something about this wild Montana territory that seems to be calling my name. I can't rightly explain it no better than that. But I know that this here is where I belong. Very well, Mary. The children will miss you. They adore you so. We'll all miss you very much. Well, I thanks you for that, daughter. Um, I mean, Mother Mary, thank you. And I want you to know I'll miss all of y'all, too. Mary, I have an idea. Before I go, let me see about getting you established here in Cascade. Mm. I'll make some inquiries, and hopefully we can find you some permanent employment here. Now, let me think. Oh, I've got it. I know just the person to contact. Really? I'm going to go downtown right with Mother Mary's help, I opened a restaurant in Cascade, which is a small town just east of St. Peter's Mission. Folks would come from miles around just to taste my cooking, and I didn't discriminate neither. I served everybody. Black, white, Indian, didn't matter whether you could pay or not. Nobody got turned away. <laughs> I went broke in about 10 months. I went back to work at St. Peter's Mission hauling freight, doing laundry, growing vegetables, tending chickens, whatever needed doing, I did it. I even worked as a carpenter and mason. I did such a good job repairing the buildings that they made me the forewoman. I was telling white and colored men what to do and where to go 
every day. Guess I got so good at it that the Indians took to calling me White Crow. They had never seen a woman with black skin act like a woman with white skin before. It took a little getting used to for the white man who was working under me, but I just had to show him who was boss. Ellis, I need you and Tom to head into town and pick up that fencing for y'all knock off for the day. We'll start putting it up first thing tomorrow morning. You gotta be kidding. That's gonna take us pretty near two hours there and back. In case you ain't noticed, it's one hour till quitting time. You got me confused with one of your own people. I ain't no slave. Me neither. And I know what time it is. You getting paid for your time, so quit your belly aching. That ain't the point. You can't just... The more you keep drawing about it, the later it's gonna get. That's it. That's it. I've had it. It's bad enough I, I gotta take orders from some darky. But if I wanted to be bossed around by a woman, I'd have stayed married. With your attitude, Ellis, wouldn't have been long for she'd have shot you in your sleep. Now get to that fencing like I told you. By God, don't no black bitch talk to me like that. You call that a punch, Ellis? Them nuns hit harder than that. Oh, you want some more, huh? Woman or no, I'll drop you right here. Come on, then. Now that you ain't hitting me when I ain't looking like a little coward, let's see what you can really do. Damn you! <laughs> Had enough? All right, somebody pick him up and get him out of here. This is African American History is American History. Welcome back. You're listening to the story of Stagecoach Mary Field. Local whites in Cascade didn't know what to make of me. One girl in the all-white school there in town wrote an essay on me. It said, She drinks whiskey, fights, and she swears. And she's a Republican, which makes her a low, foul creature. The sisters was always trying to smooth out my rough edges, but they couldn't do it. I liked who I was. I could drink, smoke, cuss, fight, and shoot with the best of them. Revolver or rifle. Everybody in the whole damn Montana Territory knew Mary Fields to be a crack shot. One day, another disgruntled white male who worked under me decided that he'd taken all he was going to take from that female nigga boss and chose to handle the situation by drawing on me. That was a big mistake. Because he was way too slow. <laughs> more and more, the men started to complaining about having a woman bossing them around <laughs> and beating them up. There was this one ranch hand. I don't recall his name, but he and I just didn't get along no way, no how. I remember this one time. We got into it over a damn harness. A harness? He commenced to swing it on me. I told him that he best put his hands down. But he was so mad, there were no reason with him. So I just reached down and picked me up a rock and emphasized my point with a nice-sized dent in the fool's head. Bishop Rondell. Now he was the first Catholic bishop in Montana. Well, he came to St. Peter's on account of all the complaints against me and ordered me to leave the convent. That was in 1895. I was 60 years old and out of work. This is African American History is American History. Welcome back. You're listening to the story of Stagecoach Mary Field. With the help of a letter of recommendation from Mother Mary Amadeus and kind words from a few of the sisters at St. Peter's and friends in Cascade, I was able to get a job as a mail carrier. I was the second woman and first colored woman to even work for the U.S. Postal Service. The postmaster for the territory didn't think I could do the job at first, but armed with a pair of six shooters on my hip, and a 10-gauge shotgun on my lap, I was more than ready to handle the job. I quickly earned a reputation as someone who you could count on to deliver your letters and parcels on time, every time. No matter what the weather, no matter how rugged the terrain, Stagecoach Mary, they called me. I liked that. 
For years, I got that mail delivered through powerful thunderstorms, bone-chilling blizzards, and summer heat that melt the skin right off your bones. I fought coyotes, wolves, Indians, and pesky bandits who were dumb enough to think I was an easy mark. You know, without me getting important mail through to remote miners' cabins and government outposts, Montana might not have developed into the state it is today. But of course, don't nobody want to give me no kind of credit for my contribution. Hell, it don't really matter. I know what I did. I never missed a day of work, and I never failed to deliver a single letter. At the age of 70, I decided it was time to retire from the mail delivering business. But I was far from rich. So I started to look for a job that would give me a steady income without it wearing the hell out of me now that I'm older. I opened a laundry service right there in the town of Cascade. It was a lot less stressful than fighting the weather, wolves, Indians, and assorted bandits just to deliver a bunch of letters and packages to people. Yes, sir, I figured I deserved to relax a bit. When my regular customers wanted their laundry done, they knew just where to find me. <laughs> oh, hell no. Not in the store. In the saloon. Drinking whiskey and smoking cigars. I brought in a lot of new customers for that saloon. Folks that come from all over just to have a drink with Stagecoach Mary. <laughs> yes, sir. I was quite the celebrity in Cascade. I used to bet them fools who didn't know me five dollars and a glass of whiskey to the first man that I can't knock out with one punch. <laughs> I tell you this, I never had to pay for my whiskey and I always left that saloon with change in my pocket. I remember one day a stranger came to town and ordered extra starch in the cuffs and collars of his shirts. Well, I done the job for him, and the lout refused to pay me my two dollars. So I chased him down the street, caught him, spun him around, and hit him so hard that a tooth went flying out of his head. I was 72 at the time. Now, my policy was, if you couldn't pay, if you was down on your luck, just let me know up front. Hell, most everybody knew me as a soft touch, if and you was honest. But you try and outright stiff me, whoo, I will lay you out. <laughs> but you know, for the most part, just about everybody that lived in Cascade was kind and decent. In 1912, my home burned down. Everything was burned right down to the ground. But you know what? The entire town got together and built me a new house. Yes, sir. Years of hard drinking and cigar smoking took their toll on poor Mary's liver. And in 1914, at the age of 82, stagecoach Mary Fields died of liver failure. Her many friends and neighbors held a funeral for her. The members of the Cascade baseball team came to show their respect to their biggest fan, who would give flowers from her garden to any player who hit a home run. Mary was laid to rest at the Hillside Cemetery in the town of Cascade, Montana. There's an interesting side note. One of the many jobs that Mary Fields took on was babysitting. She babysat all the children in Cascade whenever their parents were away. They wouldn't trust their kids to anyone else. Well, one day she was babysitting a young boy and his friend who was visiting from Helena, Montana. Mary would entertain the boys with tales of the Old West. That little visitor from Helena grew up to become one of the greatest film legends of all time. Gary Cooper. In 1959, just two years before his own death, Gary Cooper wrote an article for Ebony Magazine on Mary Fields, in which he said, Born a slave somewhere in Tennessee, Mary lived to become one of the freest souls ever to draw breath. Or 38. 
This has been African American History is American History. The story of stagecoach Mary Fields was written, directed, and produced by Harlan Kearsley. Production coordinator is Sarah Cushing Downs. The cast included Soraya Butler as stagecoach Mary Fields and Sarah Cushing Downs as the little white schoolgirl and mother Mary Amadeus. I'm Harlan Kearsley. On behalf of everyone here at African American History is American History, thank you for listening. And remember, none of us can truly embrace the future until we first confront the past. African American History is American History. Copyright H.C. Kearsley, 2015.